What's going on, everybody? More Lance Gidry news as we get into it here. Miami's new defensive coordinator. We're going to take a look back at his time at McNeese State as head coach. Uh, he played there, but we've got David E. Berry here covered at McNeese State at the time. So let, let's get into it. But David, I'm excited to talk to you about him. How are you doing here? Man, I'm doing great. I, you know, uh, it's a, this is a collision of worlds, man. You know, like I said, I grew up in Miami, a huge, huge Canes fan. So when I saw it, even before, you know, you approached, you messaged me, I was like, man, just knowing that I covered the guy that's now the defensive coordinator at, at the school I root for, it's just a crazy collision of worlds. But no, nah, man, I'm really, I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah, and I'm excited to get into it because, as we mentioned before we start recording, there's not a lot of people that that could speak about him that have this kind of expertise um, during the, his time at McNeese State. So let, let's get into it. So he played there in the '90s, defensive back there, three coaching stints over his coaching career, including being the head coach from 2016 to 18. After he was a defensive coordinator there, and during that third stint, and that's what I want to. We'll start with that, uh, with, with him being a head coach. Uh, I guess, what would you say about his personality, those kinds of things uh, about him? How, how would you explain to people uh, the kind of guy uh, Coach is? Uh, he was really, he was cool to talk to. Um, I forget the day, if it was a t every Tuesday, we go in for our, you know, our weekly press conference that, you know, every coach has. Um, and But he was different. Like, we'd go up to his office. He would sit in one of the chairs in his office and we'd kind of just sit around him. Obviously, we weren't the, it wasn't a huge collection of writers. It'd probably be like me and maybe the t the local TV guy. Like it'd be probably two or three, maybe four reporters there. And we would just take questions right there. You know, um, he would take them and he wasn't shy about a answering questions generally. He's very, very honest guy. Um, very I th I thought he was personable and uh, we'll kind. I kind of get into kind of what happened in the, in, after, but yeah, I enjoyed talking to him. He was really, really upfront with stuff. Um, you know, as much as like he, you know, there were certain things that he probably, I'm sure, didn't get into. But yeah, I mean, I don't know any other coach that would just say, "Hey, come up. We're gonna have our weekly press conference in my office. I'm just gonna like." There was no, um, there wasn't a desk in between us, anything like that. We were just right there. So I enjoyed them and it was tough when I got to, when I got to the American press, it kind of started going downhill the, the latter half of the 2018 season. But, um, so, you know, obviously he wasn't in the best mood every time, but he was always there. He never ducked from the media. So, um, that wasn't the issue on, you know, where it kind of fell apart, but I get, you know, we'll get into it, but yeah, overall, I really enjoyed him, per his personality. And I think it's going to work well as far as getting like dealing with the players at, at UM. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely get into it because it is an interesting situation. Like I said, I definitely want to dive into this. So he was there three years, winning season all three years, six and five on, on the back ends, and then in the middle, the nine and two season, uh, and certainly played well. We'll get into some statistics, uh, particularly on defensive side of the ball, but staying more with him as a head coach, um, him as a coach in general, but as a head coach, what, what's kind of the expectations he places on his players? If you can speak on that a little bit, what we kind of knew about that, and also maybe discipline, that's always a big for a head coach, but maybe how he was as a head coach uh, overseeing the whole team, obviously is different. At Miami, he's still going to oversee the defense because with Coach Cristobal, he's going to let him kind of run the defense, so he's going to have that half of the ball there. Uh, but what would you say about those kinds of things as a head coach, as a coach? I'm going to say this is probably the perfect situation because to be delicate, he is a player's coach. And, you know, I don't think you'll find many players at McNeese and probably at Marshall. Uh, and I know he had a stop in Southeastern Louisiana. The players liked him. The players played for him. And I remember when he got let go, like it was a big thing. Players, you know, they were upset. But he might have been too much of a player's head coach, um, and that came at the expense of uh, academics. And I, to kind of jump ahead a tiny bit, when he got let go, there was no real – like all they, all it was was that they just didn't renew his contract, right? But the next year it came out 
that the APR scores took a huge dip his last, I want to say it was his last, his last two years as head coach. Uh, and it went under the, I want to say it's like the 930 threshold for the APR, which means they had a bowl ban or not bowl, a postseason ban in 2020. You know, that didn't end up happening anyways, but yeah, um, it's great for him, I think, because he'll get to control the defense, but he's not going to be in charge of kind of everything else. And I don't know, maybe he's grown as a head coach. We'll never, fi- we're not going to find that out right now, but I think he's going to need Mario to kind of be that one to to be on top and making sure the kids are doing everything else. Um, funny story. I remember he didn't really like kind of, I, I think I wrote a column that was kind of, criticizing how he was from a head coaching standpoint, letting the academics go. And there are other things that I did hear about how a lot of stuff got let go, but you know, it's kind of stuff you hear as a reporter and I was, you know, it's nothing that you want to put out there, but the stuff that I knew for sure, I wrote a column criticized. He didn't like it. So, you know, if you saw me now, you probably wouldn't necessarily love my face, but uh, you know, the facts are the facts. The APR when he was there those last couple of years was just not good. But since he's not going to be the one in charge of that, I, I think ultimately if he can just coach that defense and make sure that they are putting up great numbers on Saturdays, I think this is a perfect spot for him right now. David, let, let's stay on that defense. And again, he coached all, all over the place, and it'll be interesting. You know, just real quick with the Miami tie, I find interesting. Co- Cody Orgeron uh, was the quarterback there for a couple years, a backup guy. He's right now at UM uh, as a co- QB analyst right now. So that, that's an interesting tie right there. But defensively uh, at Magni State, the numbers do jump up, uh, jump off the page. They were very good defensively, particularly third down. I will get into that. Uh, but just the third, the defense in, in general, those three years, the nine and two season, obviously w- was the best year of that fifth, I think in the country in total defense, led it and run defense. But what, 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 what do you think of the defense uh, under coach there? Yeah, they were salty. Um, even the year. So the, the year when I got there in 2018, the defense was still great. I mean, they produced two Southland conference defensive players of the year in 2018. It was BJ Blunt. In 2015, it was Wallace uh, blah, blah, Wallace Scott. Yes, got a name. Yeah, um, they that year they went nine and two. That that was a big controversy, uh, if you ask me, these fans, because I think they played an FBS program and or maybe another high level FCS, and then they played Florida Tech. So those are the two non conference. They didn't get in, and a lot of people say it's because of strength of schedule, but. That team is really, really good. But, yeah, those defenses, very aggressive. Um, they're going to get after you. If I had to say where they can get picked, is that, you know, as with most aggressive aggressive defenses, you, you can tend to give up something here or there on the back end. But um, And that happened in 2018. I remember they played Incarnate Word, and that was one of – that was kind of after the slide started – and yeah, they got they got picked apart pretty bad. Um, they played Houston Baptist, now Houston Christian, and current New England quarterback Bailey Zappi. He was there. Uh, they put thirty four points on them. So some of those pass, uh, those air raid pass heavy defenses, gave them a little trouble. But like you said, overall they were really good. And obviously, somebody following Miami knows those third down. That's a huge Achilles. So to have somebody in there that is so good at third down defense, and it seems like no matter where he goes, he's good at that. And then the thing I noticed kind of doing my own little research is that the defense always seems to get better from year one to year two, wherever he goes. So, um, yeah, I the defense is while he was there because he ran the defense at McNeese. Like when he was the defensive coordinator, obviously it was him. And then even when he took the head coaching job, it's rare to see a defensive guy do that. Usually it's the offensive guy. But, yeah, he um, – at worst, I think he's had a couple defenses that ranked in the 70s. But, like, usually his defense is either, like, good or great. So, yeah, I think it's something to be really excited about. 
the th- the third down again, and you, you nailed it. Wherever he's been, it's it's been pretty good, you know, if not really good. Uh, third down defense. Is there something in particular that you could state uh, of why it's been so good over the years, or anything at McNeese State? Do you remember of of why it was so successful? I mean, I think his he's gonna he's gonna try and bring pressure, and he puts trust in his defense backs. Like he puts the trust in there, and obviously, like I said, it helps. You got defensive players of the year that are on your team. And, you know, B.J. Blunt was an edge guy. Uh, Wallace Scott, he was a safety. So you've got those guys, um, and he puts the trust in them to go make those plays. Like, they're not sitting back and waiting for things to happen. And, again, it'll it'll bite them. You know, you're going to give up a, a long play here or there. But the numbers show he's getting off the field on third down. So I really – like I said, I, that's something I'm excited about because you know, I mean, like I, I'm not, I, I'm not telling you anything new. It's, it's, it would get draining to see third and whatever, double digit yardage, and it gets uh, converted. So, uh, yeah, I think it's just the trust that he has, and that goes into him being a player's coach. Like he's a great guy. He's he's Southwest Louisiana through and through. You're gonna hear it. It's. Uh, I wouldn't quite call it, it's it's not quite as thick his accent as like an Ed Orgeron, but you go hear it. Like if you're out of practice, I'm sure you're gonna hear it. Um, but yeah, like that third down. Like if if all he gives us is a if all he gives Miami is a great third down defense, like that's that alone is is worth his weight in gold. You touched on play. You mentioned some players with BJ Blunt in particular. The, the numbers obviously jump off. Over 100 tackles, the the one season there. Over 100 tackles, over 20 for loss, and 10 sacks at 120 10. Uh, uh, huge numbers from him. What 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 allowed him to to be so good? And obviously deserves a lot of credit individually, but maybe with what Coach Barry helped him with, or the type of player he was. You said he mentioned uh, you said edge a, a little bit there, but what, what kind of thing did Coach do to to help bring essentially bring the most out of uh, BJ there? Well, well, the crazy thing is, is he came from JUCO as a safety. So, like, he, like, brought him into the box. And, again, it's – I mean, he had to, you know, develop, get stronger in the weight room. But I really do think it's the belief and you pair him with the scheme of, you know, that being aggressive and letting guys get loose. And that's what happened. Um yeah, he was he was a maniac uh, trying to you know get into the quarterback that year. Um, yeah, I just again it, it really to to me does just come down to the trust, and it's funny because um, you know it's always going to be people that don't like a hire or whatever, and you know as naysayers are saying, well, it's you know it's only the FCS, it's only whoever. But my thing is is he was at an FCS. He was getting that same type of talent. So it's not like he was playing with a different, you know, 85 scholars. It was like, no, he was playing with the same amount. So for him to do that there with good talent, but not power five talent, I, again, I'm excited to see what he can do just with the guys that Miami has now forgetting who they may get in the transfer portal later on in the spring. But yeah, he just, he believes in the players and he gets the players to believe in themselves. I think that shows itself at Marshall, you know, when they go on the road and shut, not shut down, but slow down heavily a team like Notre Dame. So, yeah, I think the, again, I think the belief is just a major factor in it. Yeah. You touched on that Notre Dame game. I'm curious, maybe if you have any memories of the BYU game while he was at Mini State there, they get blown out 30 to three with the score, but, they they hung in early there, uh, less than 300 yards of total offense by BYU. And uh, anything that stands out to you with that game? Anything you remember uh, of how coach this team played in that one? So unfortunately, I got there maybe maybe about three weeks after. It was a it was a mid season thing, um, but I do remember I asked the players about it and I asked coaches about that game because you know you're going on the road and you're going up against. You know, BYU's pretty consistently one of the better group of five teams in the country. And, uh, yeah, they went up there. And that year, the offense struggled mightily, toward, particularly towards the end of the year. Um, 
And I think if that offense had even been average, they probably make the playoffs. But they went up there and the defense – Again, they just believed. The defense thought that they could shut down BYU. And, again, you know, 30 points. But like you said, it was not just – it It wasn't smooth sailing for BYU the whole time. Um, yeah, it, it's – he's one of those guys. He's going to get the players to buy in and to want to run through a brick wall. Um, I'm, I don't know if you've seen it, but I know a lot of people when – he the hire was made posted the video of uh Gidry making a speech after I want to say it was a bowl game when he was at Western Kentucky and you know it was just one of those that it, it, it you know raised the hairs on your, on your on your skin so yeah um like I said unfortunately I wasn't there so I couldn't give you like the first hand account but I do remember like those kids they were not they were just like, no, this is an this is an offense that we're going in and we're going to shut down. And again, they didn't necessarily shut them down, but I'm sure that BYU offense would probably tell you, like, nah, that's that was a that was a really really tough defense, particularly given it was at the FCS level. Yeah, and, and top twenty five team going into that game, BYU was, you know, the motivational stuff. I, I'm curious your takeaways on that uh, with coach. It seemed like he got his guys up for that one. Um, you touched on uh, previous experiences, but getting guys to play, especially defensively, what can you say on that and essentially how he leads a defense or, or a group of guys to, to play their best, you know, when times are tough? Yeah, um, I mean, he did it fairly well. Now, again, when I <laughs> once I got there, that was, I want to say they may, I think they won, I can't remember if they won or lost the very first game I went to I think they won it a, a close one then you could just tell that I don't necessarily say it was the defense that was losing belief not a, not in coach Gidry but it was more the offense just was not moving the ball I mean, they just couldn't move the ball and to be fair like I said when they played incarnate word that year incarnate words offense did did give them some work. They did give them a lot of trouble. But for the most part, the defense was keeping them in a lot of games. It's just the offense really couldn't do much to do like they they, they could couldn't do the bare minimum just to even get them past that, you know, like if they held to held a team to 20, they couldn't get that 21st point. So, uh yeah, I I think they he's not going to have a problem getting these kids to believe um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think game plan is going to be an issue. Um, as long as they, as long as the kids are ready to buy in, he's going to make sure he's going to do his part to make sure that they feel like they need to buy in. As long as they feel like they need to buy in, I think that that's the that's not going to be a problem at all. We're, we're touching so much on his time, obviously at McNeese State. There quite a bit. There's a player from Louisiana, as you mentioned. Recruiting wise, well, obviously a big a big deal at Miami. It's different when you're at a school like McNeese State. But is there something that maybe he learned either as a head coach or even just recruiting in certain areas that you think that will translate and really help him uh, as a recruiter at, at Miami? You know, I'm I thought about that, and I'm really interested to see how he's going to approach it because that was you know McNeese so far that was his only spot as the permanent head coach. I know he was the interim at Western Kentucky, um, but he was at FAU for a year. Uh, I, I guess I'd have to see how he did, but he's never been at this level, like recruiting these type of guys on a consistent basis. So I guess I'm really interested to see how that goes, but I think it'll help him, I guess, whoever his staff is on the defense around him. And I know – Dennis Smith, he's another Louisiana guy, and I think that's going to help a lot. And I've seen they've already handed out some offers in Louisiana, so I think that'll I think that'll really help him a lot. And I know this uh, Mario Crystal Ball's recruiting philosophy is not like you, we're not staying in one area; like we're going to go wherever the players are. And Louisiana's got a lot, you know, they've got a lot of players. So I think if if he can even help get, you know, one or two of those top recruits out of the state of Louisiana, like 
I think that'll be a major plus because everybody knows it's tough to go up against LSU uh, to get those guys out of state and then the other guys that just want to stay in the SEC kind of bubble. Um, but no, I, I, I'm kind of just as curious as everybody else to see how he's going to do at this level. But I, I believe if he was able to do it at McNeese where he's got good talent and he was able to go and do it at FAU, do it at Marshall. Like, I think, I think with his personality, I do think he'll be able to succeed uh, recruiting at Miami. So coach goes six and five there that first season, nine and two that we keep mentioning. And then his final year, six and five. What can you say about that final year in 2018? Essentially the fallout, he wasn't asked back. Um, what, what can you say about that uh, that time and, and how he kind of handled that? And obviously he's moved on since and at a spot like Miami. But what do you remember about that, the way it ended? Yeah, that was that was when I was there. I was the I was I was in the meat of it. Um and I wanna say they lost four out of their last five or yeah, I think it was four out of their last five. And it went from I guess the issue was is that man, it went from like, man, McNeese is gonna get a national seed, like top four seed in the playoffs, to all right, well they're gonna definitely get into the playoffs. It might be as a like eight or whatever, but I think they'll host to, okay, well, they're on the bubble, but I think they're still good, and they've won enough games to make it. To last game of the season against Lamar, like, you probably aren't going to make it even if you win, but you definitely need to win to give yourself a chance. They lost. Lamar ended up getting in, I remember, and we met, again, like I said, we met in Coach's office for the last um, press con- his press conference after the season, and I, I remember he was – he said he didn't know, but he wanted to come back. And obviously, all there was no firing because he was just out of contract. So I remember we got that news. And like I said, a lot of players were upset. Um, and, and because he's such – he is a Southwest Louisiana guy, there were a lot of fans that were upset. <sighs> I could see why they let go, let let him go, and obviously, knowing what we found out a year later with the APR thing, it made even more sense because, like, they the the APR went into the toilet. Um, so I I understand it from that perspective, but I know a lot of fans were emotional because of, like you said, he's from the Southwest Louisiana, went to McNeese. Great, I think you know. First job was I think he was a GA, and they coached there a bunch. So I get it, but I think ultimately it was a move that had to be made. Um, you know, and he there's other things, but I think ultimately he is kind of getting back on track how he wants to. Um, is he a head coach yet? No, but I think he's doing pretty well for himself. Uh, defensive coordinator at a power five school. So yeah, that year was, it was tough, but you kind of could see the writing on the wall. I mean, you, you can defend yourself and be a player's coach and all of that stuff, but the way they regressed as the season went on and the offense, the offense was just horrible to watch. It was really, really bad. They just weren't moving the ball. It was just a slog. So I the, Next head coach they hired was the offense to die. Um, so yeah, it just none of that's it, it didn't surprise me that he got like that he was not renewed. Um, but obviously, like I say, the emotions got to everybody. So, but I think you know he's 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 picked he's rebounded afterwards. Yeah, he's definitely rebounded at Miami. We will see how things go there. Eleven years as an assistant as a coach at McNeese State over three stints there. I, David, I appreciate you dropping the knowledge. Uh, like I said, from the beginning, there's not a lot of people that, that can provide this kind of insight. So I definitely appreciate it. And your ties to, to Miami and everything uh, make it great. Uh, so I appreciate your time for taking uh, the time to do this. And, and we'll talk to you later. And thanks for having me. This is this is cool. I haven't... Uh... Uh, not not often that I get a lot of uh, FBS teams that want some FCS knowledge, so I'm always happy to to impart it whenever I can. But now, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.